If you're about to play Hogwarts Legacy and want to know some tips, tricks, and useful information that will make the game more enjoyable for you before you do apparate in, then this video is for you because I'm going to break down all the important information I wish I had known before playing the game, and I also won't be giving away any main storyline spoilers here so you're in safe hands. And my thanks go to Warner Brothers and Avalanche Software for pinging me across a review code so I could get this guide out to you very swiftly. And let's first cover some of the basics, and that's game length, because it took me approximately 20 hours or so to finish the main story at a solid pace with another additional 40 plus hours to complete all the side activities and collectibles but I am sure some of you will be quicker in fact the game takes a while to open up as you'll need to play through the main storyline for around seven to eight hours until you're able to access the room of requirement the village of Hogsmeade and the rest of the world map so I would really recommend you focus on the storyline initially until all of these things unlock as the game is quite restrictive until you do and it will become very clear to you when you're able to free roam around the map there is also no no pets in this game, only the owl post mechanic, which is an in-game mailing system. And it's important to note here, if you don't open up some of these letters, which are quests that are sent to you, then they won't hit your quest log. And you may get to a point whilst playing the game and wondering why you can't continue the main story. And that is the reason. So make sure you open your post. Now, speaking of quests, the map can be a bit challenging to view, even though it visually looks great, especially in Hogwarts. So a good tip here is to press the show on map button when your icon is highlighted in your quest log which will then plan a route for you and then when you're out of the menus if you press up on the d-pad to activate your magic compass that will then lead you to where you need to go now as for broom flight this is another mechanic which takes around five or six hours of storyline to unlock which you can then learn by attending a flying class and that quest will pop up on your screen when it does become available now after you do have your broom and the map is open to you i'd also recommend you go flying around the world map and activating the flu powder fast travel network locations and this means that you have time to get the hang of the flight controls and you get to see this awesome open world and it also means you can quickly teleport around the map saving you time with future quest hand-ins in the future there is also no penalty that i could find from sneaking around the castle at night in fact you can change from night to day by simply opening up the map and pressing the r3 joystick button on your controller and make sure you use the left and right d-pad buttons on this menu by the way to flip back and forth between the regions on your map and not bringing your cursor up to the top to then go back and forth between hogsmeade and Hogwarts that took me way too long to figure out just use those d-pad buttons it's a lot faster now whilst we're on the map you're also going to come across a lot of chests and loot whilst you're exploring but they're not of all equal value the first ones you need to be aware of are your standard run-of-the-mill chests these contain galleons which is the game's gold currency and random gear you can equip and sell at shops but more on that in a little bit because the next chest you'll come across is the collection chests and these contain outfit cosmetics as well as items for your room of requirement which are denoted on your map by zooming out and then hovering your icon over each region or section of Hogwarts which will display all the collectible information within that region including how many collection chests are in that area that you will need to acquire. Additionally you're going to come across disillusionment chests in game which are easy to spot as they have a huge eye on the front of them and the name of the game here is to cast the disillusionment charm on yourself which you obtain by completing a very early and optional class side quest at Hogwarts and once you've done so all you need to do is is simply sneak up to it and then open it up. Now these contain 500 galleons a pop which is a huge sum in game and there's actually six or seven dotted around Hogsmeade so I'd encourage you to sprint around casting the Revelio spell which you'll have by the time you reach Hogsmeade and make an easy 3k gold. Now a final chest worthy of mention here is the house chest which you'll find in your common room. Now this chest will grant you the relic house uniform which can only be unlocked after completing the side quest given by Nelly Ogspire in the Transfiguration Courtyard and you'll need to find flying keys around Hogwarts which then unlocks these closed cabinets and once you open these closed cabinets you'll pick up house tokens and you'll need 16 of them to then unlock this chest so get your broom ready and good luck on that one. Now let's talk about some good things to know about the room of requirement because as mentioned it will take several hours before it becomes available to you but you will know when it does because Professor Weasley will prompt you with a quest and will then walk you through all of the basics and this is where you're going to be brewing your potions, growing your plants and breeding your beasts for resources but all of those things of course don't unlock in one go in fact there's several room of requirement quests which will become available to you by speaking to the house elf deke but only after you progress far enough through the main story as beast class and by extension beast breeding within the 
of vivariums won't be an option until you progress into chapter two, which is approximately 12 hours of story time. So with this in mind, my recommendation here is to completely ignore the room requirement until you're around level 15. And there's three reasons for that. The first one is for the room to be an effective producer of resources and potions that you can consume in game, you'll need to purchase those recipes from four vendors in Hogsmeade, which cost a huge amount of money, more than you have at the time that you visit this room. Now, the second reason is a lot of these potions require resources to make, such as herbs and ingredients, which you don't necessarily have a lot of by the time you arrive here, but you will have a substantial amount by just running around questing outside of Hogwarts and looting all of the foliage in and around the Scottish Highlands. And thirdly, to upgrade your gear and imbue it with buffs, you need to unlock a magical loom, which you can't conjure into the room until you complete the beast quest line in chapter two, as we just mentioned. So yeah, this all does sound a little bit lame and restrictive, and it certainly is when you initially unlock it, but it really is a fantastic mechanic in game that when you fine tune it can be immensely profitable for you. And I'll have a full tips and tricks video guide out for you very soon on that. But for now, check out the cosmetic customization features in game when you do arrive into this room and come back to it when you've unlocked all of these things we've just discussed, which I think is a nice segue onto gear and upgrades and how that all works at the loom when you do unlock it. And there's a few important bits of info that you need to know here. Firstly, gear is color coded in this game with each color attributed to a better quality of gear that has more beneficial stats than its predecessing color. So you've got green here as the kind of base level gear set, and that's what's called well appointed. And that's then followed by superb, which is blue, and then extraordinary, which is purple or epic as I kind of my old World of Warcraft days there. And then you finally got orange, which is the best gear available, and that's called legendary. Now, secondly, there's three upgrade levels on each piece of gear you obtain in game. And what that means is that when you decide you like the stats of a specific item and want to improve them, you can do so by selecting it in the loom and cashing in the resources that you've collected from looking after your beasts in the vivarium. This will increase your offensive stats, which then determines how much damage your spells do to enemies, or it may increase your defensive stats, which determines how much damage your character can take without dying. So in short, more offense means more damage and more defense means less health lost. And it will be up to you to balance that depending upon your own preference and item choice in game. Now, thirdly, gear that is blue and above have the options of traits to be applied to them, which can give you specific perks that can be added to that individual gear item. An example here being that I have imbued my draconic long coat here with a trait that increases damage with Expelliarmus as I use that spell quite a lot in game. But not all traits are equal as you can unlock more powerful traits traits by completing challenges, which I'll get to in a moment. But just know there are three tier levels for traits with the top tier, that being level three, offering you some solid buffs that complement your own play style. Now, one final tip to know before we move on, by the way, you can't disenchant gear for resources or ingredients. So if you're not going to use it, make sure you sell it for gold. Otherwise, it's just taking up space in your infantry. But what about gear customization? Can you do that in game? Well, you most certainly can. And this is a feature I'm really pleased with because you can actually change the look of your gear to whatever you want without sacrificing your stats on your currently equipped piece of gear. Now, all you need to do is head into the gear screen from the pause menu. And when you hover your cursor over one of the six gear slots, you'll notice an option which says change appearance. And once you've given that a click, you'll jump into a preview menu that shows a full list of items you can change your current item into, or you can select the invisible option if you just want to run around Hogwarts in a jumper. Now, a super important thing to note here is that whenever you loot a gear item in game, it automatically will appear in this transmog menu, even if you just loot it and sell it without ever equipping it. So don't worry about hoarding these items in your inventory if you like the visual look of it. Now, another good tip here is specifically for your cloak, where you can toggle the hood option on and off by hovering your cursor over the item itself. And my Assassin's Creed friends will understand the pain we endured by not having this simple mechanic available at launch in Valhalla. But alas, once you've visited Ollivander's and got your wand, you'll also be able to customize the handle, which are cosmetic rewards found throughout the world and you'll be able to change the look of your broom in game as well by purchasing different cosmetic looks from traveling vendors and the sporting goods store in Hogsmeade and whilst we're at Hogsmeade you can visit the barber or salon to get a trim allowing you to change everything in the character creation screen except for your face so when you do create yourself at the start of the game just make sure that you get your face right as everything else can be altered later on now if you've learned something new or enjoying the video so far please do leave a very swift like down below as it really helps me out so 
thank you very much. And while you're down there, do subscribe if you're new here. I've got lots of Hogwarts Legacy videos just like this coming to you thick and fast to help you get the most out of this game. So it'd be great to have you along for the ride. Now let's go over some companions and side quests because they're only as important as you want them to be. And what I mean by that is you can completely ignore them as I completed the main storyline without finishing any of the three main narrative companion quests, that being Nat Sionai, Poppy Sweeting, and Sebastian Sallow. And I say main narrative because they reward you with something substantial in game, which I'll break down for you in a second, because there is a Ravenclaw companion called Amit Thakar you come across in astronomy class who can translate gobbledygook, which is the goblin spoken tongue, and who also provides you with a telescope, which can then be used to unlock the astronomy tables around the world, which are the moon icons on your map. And they will reward you with a variety of different cosmetics if you do decide to do them. Now that said, if you do decide to complete these optional companion quests, they will integrate themselves and assist you in the main narrative story. So for example, I finished Amit's quest and then he joined me in another quest automatically where he translated goblin runes and sped up that quest significantly. And the same can be said for others. If you complete Seb's quest line, you'll unlock all unforgivable curses, which you can then use against main storyline characters, including Avada Kedavra, the killing curse, with Nat Sionai's quest rewarding you with the ability to fly and ride magical creatures, which also helps you out in the main story. And Poppy Sweeting, introducing you to a variety of different magical creatures for breeding and valuable resources. So just know you can't summon them or open up an in-game menu to bring them with you as you explore the world. But if you do decide to complete their quests, they will very subtly integrate themselves into that main narrative, which you may not even realize, but it will benefit you in some way. Now, another tip here that will benefit you significantly in the long run, and that's increasing your infantry space, which sounds quite simple, but if this isn't done early in the game, it will cause you a headache further down the line when you're in the middle of a main story quest or a dungeon and you're having to destroy gear to actually make space for new loot, which you could have otherwise sold to vendors for galleons. Now the game devs know this, which is why they've popped it behind the famous Merlin trial mini games, which require you to solve puzzles created by Merlin himself that are scattered throughout the Scottish Highlands. But to get them to appear on your map, you'll need to speak to Nora Treadwell via Natsai Onai's main quest, which will then open up the trials for you. And you'll need to scatter mallow sweet leaves on the stone circular floors, which you can grow in your room of requirement, by the way. And then once you do scatter them, you'll activate the trial and then solve it to contribute to the tally of unlocking an infantry slot. Now, the first one being two Merlin trials required for an unlock and the next being six. So I'd recommend you smash out eight of these Merlin trials early doors to give yourself a little bit more looting room. And as for unlocking doors and locks around the game, though, you'll need to learn the Alohomora unlocking charm from the caretaker, which is a quest that pops up in chapter two after the autumn cutscene plays, which is approximately around 10 to 15 hours with the name of the game being that you need to find these demiguise statues hidden around the castle and the highlands at night and then return them to him. You need nine demiguise collected for a level two Alohomora unlock and 13 statues for a level three. So if you can't figure out how to pick up a demiguise statue early doors, don't worry, just get to chapter two and then speak to the caretaker. But what about classes? Can you skip them? Well, yes and no, because some of the classes will need to be completed for the main storyline as they award you with certain spells that offer a environmental function that's needed for the main narrative. And when that happens, the side class quest will become a main yellow quest displayed in your quest log, which means it's mandatory and you need to do it before you can continue. And these side class quests are called professor assignments, which give you a task to do that is very centric to their profession. And as a reward, you'll learn a spell off them. An example here being assignment from Professor Sharp. So if we want to learn the cutting or slicing spell, that being Defindo, we'll need to use an invisibility potion and a thunderbrew potion against enemies whilst in combat. Of course, Professor Sharp being the potion master, so this kind of all adds up. And once we have completed this task, we can then return to him and learn the spell. But that's not the only thing you'll get for class assignments. You'll also pick up additional rewards in the challenges menu, which as you can see here are cosmetic items for just playing certain parts of the game, that being combat, quests, exploration, field guide pages, and the room of requirements. So make sure you do check that menu frequently as you may not have realized you've actually unlocked a cool outfit that you want to wear. Now clothes aside, talents is another mechanic that does take some time to unlock in this game. It's around six hours or so after you finish a spider quest in the Forbidden Forest where you should become level five. And when you do, you can start spending points in your tree of choice that either being spells, dark arts, core, stealth, and the room of requirement. Now how this works is every time you level up, which you do by earning experience just by 
by playing the game, you'll be able to spend that one level point in a specific tree of your choice with more talents unlocking at level 15 and 22, which will provide you with additional in-game benefits. But that said, I would highly recommend that you spend your first dozen or so talent points in the core tree, specifically the spell knowledge one and two slots, as it will add additional spell diamonds to your repertoire. And this means that you can slot an additional four, eight and 12 spells, which you can then rotate through by holding the R2 button and pressing right on the D-pad when you're in combat. Now, this is a big deal because otherwise you'll need to manually add different spells to your one four slot spell diamond constantly, which becomes infuriating and very annoying. And I'd also say stay away from the other talent trees like the dark arts and the room of requirement menus, even though I know it can be tempting, but I'd say just pause that for the time being until you get to level 15 plus as you don't unlock all of the unforgivable curses until around level 27 and you won't be growing enough plants or brewing enough potions early on in the game for it to be a good investment of your valuable talent points because you're going to need them in combat which is a great highlight for me in this game i really enjoyed it and i think you will too but here's a few good tips to know before you start pinging off curses all over the shop and that spell placement in your spell diamonds when you unlock more than just one that we just discussed because certain enemies in this game will conjure a color-coded shield which will make them immune to all damage unless you dispel that red colored shield with a red colored spell you have equipped in your diamond now there may be several enemies at one time that have red shields up so instead of waiting for that red spell you just cast to come off cooldown you can switch to your second spell diamond and activate another red spell which is placed in the same slot your other red spell was placed in your first diamond so i hope that kind of makes sense because this means that you know that whatever diamond that you are switching to quickly whilst in combat you will always have a red spell in that same slot by holding r2 and pressing square so you can focus on the battle and not waste time trying to match up colors and by doing this my general enjoyment and muscle memory during combat improved and i'd recommend you organize your spell diamonds and get to know them to kind of get the most out of this game and i'd also suggest keeping the expelliarmus spell in your loadout as it's super overpowered in my opinion because you can ping weapons out of your enemy's hands and then use your free casting ancient magic throw ability by pressing r1 to fling it back at them for additional damage you'll have to unlock this talent though in the core tree to do this but it's well worth that one point earlier on in the game and it's a lot of fun to do and it's super satisfying to see. Now I've got even more tips and tricks for you in this video that should be popping up on your screen right now so give that a click so you can get even more out of this awesome game and I'll see you there in just a second but if you're still here my huge thanks to my co-content creator Nika who has joined me in early access and has scoured the game to get the best info for you. Butterbeer is on her and I'll see you in that next video.